Um, thank you all for coming out on this beautiful day and coming back into a uh, classroom. I think it's wonderful out there, but of course, uh, our speaker, Professor Lutkowski, is a draw. So what can I say? Um, on behalf of um, the program in Buddhist Studies here at Smith College, the Religion Department, and the Ada Howe Kent Program in World Religions, um, I'd like to welcome you all. There are sponsors for this event. Um, Professor Rutkowski, I'm just going to call him Nick. Okay. Yeah, Nick he's is. He's been around for a long time together. Um, his, uh, he's, he's now at the University of San Diego, but he has a colorful and uh, itinerant. <laughs> Chaotic. Uh, no, but it's a <laughs> uh, background. So um, beginning from uh, his, uh, a, a long time ago, uh, <laughs> when he got a, a master's degree at Columbia, and then deciding, uh, as we can tell from his work thereon, he wanted more. So he came back up here to, uh, to UMass, and it's fun to see some UMass folks over here, to get another degree, uh, because he wanted to pursue his studies of Buddhism, and he wanted to learn East Asian languages. So he came up here after a master's degree and got a second degree at, um, at UMass, studying Asian languages. And that's how uh, a number of us met him. I think Jay met him over here. Bruce studied, he studied with Bruce at UMass, and he studied, um, uh, he and I together read uh, texts, uh, Buddhist texts in Chinese here at Smith College, one of my few male students I've had over here at Smith College. Um, and then after that, he went on to, um, to Stanford, where he got his PhD uh, with a dissertation on ascetic lifestyles. Um, it was one of the things one of the things that he was studying here with me, and very, very rarely do I have a student who's interested in Buddhism that is also interested in the ascetic side of Buddhism. They're usually much more interested right. in contemplative practice and meditation and stress relief and things like that. So it was really interesting <laughs> to have a student who wanted to increase, increase his stress, stress level. <laughs> ascetic practices under trees and things like that. Um, but he didn't stop there. And we continued to meet each other around the world. Um, he went to Kyoto, and I knew him in Kyoto, where he studied at Kyoto University. I think we were both on the faculty there for a while and as a student in the same uh, organization. And then he went uh, to Tokyo and studied in Tokyo for another three years, um, as well as uh, continuing on. And his uh, last appointment um, before here was uh, at the Nanyang uh, University in the Department of History. Um, so in addition and in around and all of that, he's been um, writing and publishing quite a lot um, on this very interesting area, um, as well as more recently on sort of, I want to say subaltern, I don't know if that's too trendy a word to use, but on sort of subaltern traditions. Uh, in particular, um, the last time I saw him on Zoom, I do believe it was, he was talking about Ambedkar uh, and the, uh, the untouchables, as they're called, the kind of a, the Dalit class. Uh, in India and their participation in the Buddhist tradition. So uh, with all of that, it's really, it's really always fun, of course, to have one of your students come back uh, uber successful uh, and to welcome him here to the podium at Smith College. And so thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jamie. And uh, thanks to everybody who came out today. Really appreciate it. Nice to see you, Bruce. Wow. Nishida. Nishida class, I still remember that from 2005, that's amazing. Um, so, um, um, before getting started, I'd just like to thank Jamie, I'd like to thank um, all the other uh, Buddhist Studies faculty who came out and from those of you who came around from uh, Pioneer Valley, I really appreciate it. Um, I was uh, 20 years ago, I was Jamie's student, so it's truly a pleasure to return to Smith today as a speaker. So let's see, my scheduled talk um, was just the top part uh, originally. It was the challenges of returning Buddhist women monastics to historical visibility. That was originally going to be it. But I'm adding this subtitle to kind of clarify where I'd like to go, where I've been trying to go uh, in the current project uh, I have on Buddhist women, which would be something like not just doing philology or literary studies, but trying to move towards social history, which, as we know, in India is tough, but worthwhile, I think. Um, and this is, in, to my mind, because Buddhist studies tends to accept these literary or philological studies as sufficient, often stopping short of writing social history. To my mind, it's particularly important when dealing with texts about bhikshunis, about Buddhist women monastics, that we go as far as we possibly can to turn our literary studies into social history. The considerations I'll be making uh, today are part of my own preparations 
for a translation of an introduction to a particular Vinaya tradition, the Mahasangika Bhikshuni Vinaya tradition, a project that I've begun with Amy Langenberg already. So it's going to be our project to translate the text. There's a French version, but we are going to try to produce an English version. Um, we're, of course, hoping that this volume will be useful in the classroom, not just for the translations, but also and especially for the methodological and specifically historiographical considerations that are generally lacking for teaching the Bhikshuni Vinaya. So that's the sort of context for the talk and the reason for my interest in the text. So given this current translation project, my contribution to the conversation about Indian Buddhist women focuses on textual traditions representing Buddhist monastics of the early centuries of the common era. In particular, I'll be considering representations of female monastics in Buddhist legal codes, the textual traditions collectively known as Vinaya. I'll be focusing on the Vinaya of the Mahasangika school in particular, but we'll be touching upon others. The first part of the talk will deal with the question of why discovering women's voices is so difficult in Indian Buddhist traditions and why some scholars have concluded that there is simply no evidence from which to do a social history of institutional power for women in the early Buddhist monastery. In part two of the talk, I'll be focusing on the cycle of stories about a female monastic saint known as Shukla. I'll argue that these representations of Shukla provide historical evidence for the existence of a lineage of women Vinaya authors who resisted male power. Bold claim, very tentative, <laughs> but expressed boldly anyway. Shukla is best known in the Indian Buddhist tradition from the hagiographical text, the Terigata. The Mahasangika Vinaya account of Shukla is less well known, but important in its own right, because the Bhikshuni is de depicted here as a popular preacher among lay believers, uh, and possibly the broader Indian public. I wish to focus on this Vinaya narrative because of the interest the text has in, decis uh, in decisively arguing for Shukla's agency as a public face of the Buddhist order. In the final part of the talk, I will provide some context for Shukla, offering several parallels that suggest the narrative cycles of the saintly Buddhist women monastics in the Vinaya, that they should be regarded as historical evidence for the existence of a lineage of institutionally autonomous female monastics. That's the claim. In this last section, I'll argue that the structure of the Bhikshuni Vinaya text implies the historicity of a number of unsuccessful attempts on the part of deeply paternalistic forces in the Buddhist order to limit the public presence of and therefore re-domesticate female monastics. Here, I want to emphasize that Buddhist monastic women had to struggle with this attempt by patriarchal lineages to limit women's bodily autonomy and social charisma both within the Buddhist monastery, but also in the oppressive male-dominated milieu of the family. I conclude today with the claim that the author of this text is either a woman or a male advocate for the public authority of women, of, in particular, bhikshunis. Part one, reading women's vinaya as male fantasy. Why discovering women's voices is so darn difficult in the Indian traditions. So in the wake of post-structuralist hermeneutics, it's now common practice to view narratives about women in, quote, normative religious texts, such as the Vinaya, as a purely male product, authored solely for a male audience. Although there are a number of scholars who have incorporated this post-structuralist lens, Mari Yuvisiervi has outlined perhaps the most detailed and theoretically succinct argument for the suspicion that women's voices are mute in Indian Buddhist texts, and more specifically in the monastic legal codes. Yuvisiervi argues that monastic legal texts, which ostensibly deal with women's bodies and behaviors, should be understood primarily as the product of a wider discourse on restraint, on moral virtue, and constructions of maleness in medieval Indian texts. Here, I'd note that Yuvis Yervi is heavily indebted to a hermeneutics of, hermeneutics of suspicion articulated by the late Elizabeth Clark in her groundbreaking work incorporating feminist literary theoretics into the study of Western 
uh, Christian monasticisms. As Yuvis Yervi takes the Vinaya tradition to be a largely normative or prescriptive uh, text, both the authors and the audience to be male, her study cannot be what she calls any kind of social history. You can't do social history with these Vinaya texts. Rather, she says she's writing a gender history in the sense of a textual analysis that uses gender as an analytical category, nothing more. Yuvisiervi opts for a textual analysis over social history because of the limitations of medieval Indian texts as evidence for the historicity of real women, as she puts it. According to this scholarly approach, which is not limited to Yuvis Yervi, it's quite common in fact. According to this approach, the elite male monastic authors discuss the figure of the female monastic only as part of a rhetorical strategy designed to project an image of absolute male authority over the Buddhist community. And indeed, there is a mountain of evidence in the Vinaya to argue that the female Buddhist monastic body is in fact subsumed under, under the symbolic and institutional umbrella of a male monastic lineage power. The Mula Sarvastavada Vinaya's deeply begrudging permission simply to establish a bhikshuni order is a clarion call for institutionalized misogyny. In this Vinaya, the Buddha says, a dharma and a discipline in which women are ordained ananda, who is questioning the Buddha here, will not last for long. Just as a family with many women and few men is easy to attack and vulnerable to assault by thieves and kidnappers, in the same way, a dharma and a discipline in which women are ordained ananda will not last for long. The vulnerability of the female body, presumed by the monastic authorship of the Vinaya, requires constant male monastic surveillance over the bhikshuni sangha a role that effectively amounts to a structural in, in, and institutional dominance of monks over nuns. For example, Vinaya prescriptions tell us that even though nuns technically have their own hierarchy, novice nuns may not be ordained without the presence and thus approval of monks. This comes from the Mula Sarvastavada Vinaya. Monks are to instruct nuns in the Buddhist teachings, while nuns may not teach monks. And this subordination is inscribed in social relations in very, very concrete ways. For example, nuns must rise from a seated position when monks arrive in their presence, while monks need not offer formal salutation to nuns. A telling rule found in the Vinaya uh, discussed by Shane Clark forbids nuns from washing and dyeing the robes of monks. Highly domestic rules such as these, by inference, uh, reveal the extent to which the domestic roles of the household were often reinscribed in the monastery. Male monastic anxieties about the vulnerability of the female body often take the form of rules that would seem to deny that bhikshunis should have any kind of public role or even a public presence at all. While monks are permitted to move about without an escort, the Vinaya requires that nuns are always accompanied outside of the monastery. Whereas monks are permitted to meditate in the forest alone, bhikshunis may do so only behind the confines of the nunnery walls. One story is explicit about the danger the foundational Buddhist practice of begging for one's daily food poses to female monastics who try to undertake it. This story from the Mulasarvastavada Vinaya details how the nun, Kapila Bhadra, is first ogled and harassed by men when she goes begging for alms. And then, as if moralizing about the dangers of women monastics possessing any kind of bodily autonomy, is said to be kidnapped and sold off as a mistress to the king, all during her begging round. Let that be a lesson to you women, right? So says the Mula Sarvastavada Vinaya. While Yuvis Yervi states that at the outset her, of her discussion that the uh, post-structuralist approach she takes is a textual analysis and not a social history of female monastics, the evidence she marshals consistently foregrounds narratives that depict male bodies as enforcers policing female monastic bodies, limiting the agency of the latter to the absolute minimum. It would not be difficult to conclude from this reading of the Vinaya that the rhetorical reinscription of female virtue reflected an historical reality. Uh, an historical reality 
uh, of muzzled female voices and bhikshuni bodies relegated to hyper-domestic social spaces. So to sum up, the argument is that it is difficult, if not impossible, to discover women's voices in the Indian Buddhist tradition, because, and especially in the Vinaya, because there's a seamless discursive circuit between the male authors and male audiences. This interpretive orientation views legal narratives about female monastics as categorically excluding women's voices from the historical record, and thus there is no historical record of female agency in early Buddhism, particularly in the Vinaya. This is the argument which I wish to challenge. Part two, looking for Shukla as, at, at, at Shukla as historical evidence of an autonomous lineage of women Vinaya authors. So indeed, in many respects, the manner in which the narrative about the nun Shukla is consistent with Yuvas Yervi's study of normative claims about the management of female monastic life. We first encounter the nun Shukla in the Vinaya narrative before her departure for the monastic life in the domestic setting of wife and servant to her husband. In this scene, she's waiting upon him as he finishes his meal when the Buddha passes by on the Buddha's begging round. Upon recognizing the Buddha outside her home, Shukla concludes that in this, in this episode, that if her husband catches sight of the Buddha, his meal will be interrupted. So this is the very sort of domestic context in which we first encounter Shukla. Servant, probably a teenager here, uh, willing servant to her husband. Playing the dutiful role of attendant to her husband's every need, she physically blocks the view of her husband so that he will not see the Buddha and thus be compelled to pay his respects, forcing him to end his meal. In spite of her efforts, the Buddha emits a brilliant light that floods the house and the husband is interrupted anyway. Once he realizes the Buddha is present, the husband, showing no gratitude for Shukla's attempts to provide him with maximum domestic comfort, scolds her. So, you are hiding the Lord Buddha from me, aren't you? You desire to do me harm. You do not desire what is good for me. Explaining in vain to her husband her rationale for acting as she did, she broods over the situation, cursing him under her breath. To hell with this domestic lifestyle. Though I only wish to please this guy, only unpleasing things are said back to me. Shukla, after deciding to go forth as a, Buddhist female, a female Buddhist monastic, then proceeds to get permission from her husband. The Vinaya, in fact, is littered with legal discourse requiring that women receive permission from their male charge if they wish to join a monastic order. It's tempting to read this requirement of permission as a complete negation of Shukla's bodily autonomy in that she is simply detaching from the patriarch of one male line, that of the family, in order to join yet another patriarchal corporate lineage, that of the Buddha Sangha. Indeed, this flagrant violation of Shukla's autonomy is entirely consistent with Yuvas Yervi's detailed study of male monastic control over the female monastic body. Now, the ostensible purpose of introducing the Shukla narrative cycle is for Vinaya jurists to make a rather narrow legal point. And this point is that simply nuns should not spend the night outside of the monastery. They should spend the night only within the nunnery, right? It is dangerous for their bodies to be vulnerable in public spaces outside of the nunnery. The narrative introduces a scene in which Shukla is first convicted of spending a night at the house of a member of the laity. So this is sort of the setting uh, for the uh, subsequent scenes we'll be discussing. The legal argument over whether Shukla may spend the night abroad permits a plot digression, however, in which Shukla is accused of sorcery by her fellow nuns. She is accused of sorcery because of her popularity with the laity. How could she receive so many invitations if she were not bewitching the general public, is the thinking here. And this is the text. The text runs as follows. 
Shukla was invited to house after house in order to recite texts. Donations, esteem, and fame were offered to her, and her fellow bhikshunis were jealous of her. Lacking the capacity for donations and esteem, they said, she has cast a spell, and therefore it is believed by everyone that they should listen to her and have faith in her. They went to the Lord Buddha, saying, she has cast a spell. The Lord said, is this true? Is it true that you've cast a spell such that people are bewitched by you? They should take faith in you and listen to you? She said, well, I don't know any spells. How can I possibly do that? And in the end, the Lord Buddha absolved her of that sin. Here we find yet another example of the classic trope in which an uppity woman must be publicly denounced as a witch. The nuns bring this case to the attention of the Buddha, and once again, the symbolic patriarch, the Buddha, is given the authority to decide the fate of Shukla. Is she guilty of, or, uh, or innocent of witchcraft? So there we have it. Yet another case in which women are bound to the patriarchal social, social norms that define the contours of gender in medieval India more generally, and the patriarchal male Sangha specifically. And yet, this conspiracy between the patriarchy of family lineage and the regime of the Buddha Sangha to structure lives of women is not depicted in this narrative as totalizing. While Shukla is certainly not depicted as autonomous from the perspective of the kind of post-enlightenment rights tradition of liberal feminism, a careful reading suggests that there are zones in which female agency is permitted and even celebrated. I would go further and argue that within this Shukla narrative, there are episodes which suggest not only the presence of a female voice, but female authorial intention to shift institutional power, uh, uh, institutional power relationships on the ground. So I'd like to focus a moment on how we might read this sorcery episode slightly differently. Now the text accounts for the accusations by simply noting the jealousy of the other nuns. However, I believe that it's the nature of Shukla's notoriety that best explains the hostility generated. The text states that Shukla is invited from one house to another in order to bashanaya, preach, teach, recite, expound, it's not entirely clear. Edgerton's uh, 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 Sanskrit dictionary glosses the term pashanaka, the cognate term, as a reciter or knower of sacred texts. Here we have in Shukla the figure of a female monastic who occupies a role primarily reserved for monks, that of teacher of the laity, and in particular, a transmitter of the Dharma. In contrast to the common trope of women using their bodies as pedagogical devices that serve only to extinguish the, uh, male, the fire of male sexual desire found throughout sutra tropes, sutra narratives, in this narrative, Shukla's body is never discussed. In fact, I'd argue that it's precisely because this nun is not a mere prop in an erotic male fantasy that her role as a bashanaka is contested by her fellow members of the Sangha. The image of Shukla presented here departs dramatically from the many narrative tropes of female monastic redomestication found uh, elsewhere in the Vinaya. It's important to remember that the basic patriarchal structures do, as I've noted, anchor the narrative throughout. But in spite of these punctuated moments in the narrative, which certainly express the structural constraints imposed by the, the Sangha over Shukla, this nun puts into practice her conception of the female monastic vacation as a role of public engagement. And her advocacy of the female monastic as a public preacher of the Dharma is reinforced uh, is reinforced by the reciprocal relationship that she seems to have with a number of friendly householders. She is repeatedly invited by members of the Indian public, presumably by male heads of households, to speak on behalf of the Buddha Sangha. The text represents her authority as a Dharma Pashanaka when it states that, quote, it is believed by all the people that they should listen to and have faith in her, end quote. 
that the householder should listen to and have faith in her is significant because by utilizing this terminology, the text is signaling that her speech is a pure conduit for Buddha Dharma. Her role in a public space addressing both women and men should not be impugned. I'd like to pause briefly here to consider the argument about whether the language articulating Shukla's subject position is best read through the lens of liberal feminisms. I brought up the term before and it's relevant because it colors the whole way we think about women's agency in the contemporary West. Over the past 30 years or so, post-colonial feminisms have rightly taken issue with Western or liberal feminist conceptions of female agency that until quite recently informed many of these studies. Liberal feminism has tended to define a woman's agency by the rigid standards of individual legal and financial autonomy. When this Western or white liberal feminist gaze is brought to bear on contemporary communities of non-Western women, the conclusion has often been that women in non-Western religious contexts actually possess little or no agency. As Amy Langenberg has explained in a recent piece, we are coming to a place, we'll, we'll hopefully soon be in a place, in which most feminist scholars of Buddhism are now well-schooled in the post-colonial perspectives of uh, wonderful theorists such as Chandra Mohanty, Sabah Mahmood, Laila Abulugod, and Nirmala Salgado and no longer hold to the notion that only this post-enlightenment subject with individual legal and financial autonomy may be said to possess agency in her life. Indeed, studies of religious feminisms in contemporary context in re recent years have already begun to benefit from a hermeneutics that takes a more granular approach to the question of female agency. In particular, and taking seriously the culturally specific contours of the lies of non-Western women specific, uh, more generally. In the contemporary South Asian Buddhist context, Nirmala Salgado has argued that we should not understand the role of women seeking ordination in Sri Lanka through a liberal feminist lens because these women do not represent their own spiritual labors as inherently gendered. Put plainly, uh, uh, the gendered body does not define what it means to be a Sri Lankan Buddhist. The primary relationship of the nun in the Sri Lankan context, according to Salgado, is to the Buddha lineage. Gender is a distant second if considered at all. And indeed, when we consider Salgado's claim, we do find that there is no direct reference to Shukla's gender in the criticism she receives for employing black magic to uh, enchant the public, nor in any other discussion uh, of her body in this text. And while I would definitely take Salgado's critique very seriously, I'm inclined to argue that the case of Shukla is part of a much broader tradition of female monastic narratives across pre-modern Asia, which are in fact witness to rhetorical sparring over the extent to which patriarchal imperatives should silence female voices and hide female bodies. To my mind, it seems that bodies are gendered in this text, in spite of what certain post-colonial critiques would say, and therefore susceptible to more classic notions of liberal feminist critique. If we return to the narrative passage in the Shukla cycle I mentioned earlier, in which she decides to become a Buddhist nun, we find that her rationale is bound up with her gendered role as a domesticated woman of the household under the thumb of a husband who cannot be pleased no matter how hard she tries. To hell with my domestic life, she says. Degastu mama gruha vasasya, she says, angrily scowling at her husband before declaring her intention to become a nun. Shukla is then required to ask permission to leave the family lineage of her husband and join the lineage of the Buddhist monastery. A move that does seem to foreclose the possibility of Shukla's bodily autonomy. So here I think what we see in the Shukla narrative is an intense conflict over how we treat gendered bodies. I don't think we can ignore that question and I think the context is clearly there. Is a woman's body not still in this case an object of exchange, a unit of currency for purchase 
by dueling patriarchal lineage structures, family and sangha. Here, I would like to refer back to the moment in the narrative at which Shukla departs in order to point out that Shukla's entrance into the Buddhist order is not mediated by male bodies. No monks are involved at all in the process. In fact, the text states, thereupon, Sh uh, Shukla went to the residence of Bhikshuni Utpalavarna, seeking to become a monastic. The Bhikshuni Utpalavarna was a celebrated Buddhist woman uh, monastic of this time. The Bhikshuni Utpalavarna initiated her into the Buddhist order and gave her the precepts ordination. The text then states that under the guidance only of Bhikshuni Utpalavarna, Shukla extinguished her defilements and attained the six supernatural powers. So although it's difficult to say with absolute certainty that Shukla's rationale for becoming a nun fits neatly into a liberal feminist ethical framework of individual legal and financial autonomy, the social location of Utpalavarna's Bhikshuni Sangha is certainly treated as a zone in which women's agency is protected and nurtured, a zone segmented from both the paternalistic power of the household and male monastic lineages. Now at this point, even if one were to agree that the Shukla narrative is indeed written by some kind of partisan arguing against redomestication of female monastics, making the leap into the question of historicity is a problem. As scholars such as Yuvis Yervi in the Indological context and Elizabeth Clark in the context of Western antiquity argue in a kind of post-structuralist vein, it's extraordinarily difficult to attribute discourse from this overwhelmingly male-centered canonical tradition to either individual female historical figures or to some kind of historically identifiable institutional context. On what basis should we understand the Shukla narrative to be representative of a sociology of the early medieval period in which lineage of female monastics like Shukla were contending with and possibly resisting patriarchal norms. So, last section. Talking about analogies to Shukla in the Vinaya and in a Japanese context, which uh, is helpful for the historical context. So in her fantastic monograph, Hokkeiji and the Reemergence of Female Monastic Orders in Pre-Modern Japan, Professor Lori Meeks of USC has provided an important parallel to the discussion of Shukla in her study of discourse as a tool for legitimation of female monastic power within the Buddhist establishment of medieval Japan. Meeks discusses the discrepancy between male priests of the Ritsu sect on the one hand and the nuns Enkyo and Shinyo on the other. This is in particular in the way that they describe the founders of their lineage and the way that they understand women's bodies. A huge divergence between the monks on the one side and the, uh, the uh, uh, chief uh, nuns of the order Enkyo and Shinyo on the other. While the priests claim that the flawed nature of female bodies required the subservience of the order of nuns to that of male monastics, the writings of Enkyo and Shinyo dispel the notion that all Ritsu nuns accepted and thoroughly internalized this rhetoric. Neither Enkyo nor Shinyo portrayed birth into a female body as a general problem that required a solution. To the contrary, they depicted the founders of their con uh, convents, Komyo and Hashihito, as divine women whose bodies were both female and perfect. They also referred to these founders of their lineage as bodhisattvas. The writings of Enkyo and Shinyo are ideal for the historian of the Japanese nunnery because the historical realities of textual production are well known. The classic standards for institutional history are generally in place. The general time frame, the location in medieval Japan, and historical individuals and communities involved in the process of textual production allow Meeks to claim with a high level of certainty 
that these Japanese nuns were pushing back against the patriarchal power of an intensely patrilineal, patrilineal society uh, uh, and a patrilineal Sangha structure. As the historical realities surrounding the authorship of the textual traditions of, the, of our text, the Bhikshuni Vinaya, the Mahasangika one, are not recorded, we cannot know for sure if the passages about Shukla are written by a male or a female monastic, and thus cannot with absolute certainty apply Meeks's conclusion that, fem that feminist rhetoric from within the nunnery suggests a kind of corresponding attempt to gain institutional power. Right? The basic idea that Meeks, uh, of Meeks's argument is that there was a blueprint in text by setting up these noble lineages of women in order to create an autonomous bhikshuni order on the ground. Written blueprint, ideally then pushing forward with institutional power on the ground and a correspondence between those two. However, the fact that both the Shukla hagiographical cycle and the writings of Enkyo argue for the existence of a genealogical tradition that lionizes Buddhist women's agency suggests to me that the former dis uh, uh, discourse evidences institutional conflicts, that there is a conflict in both cases between male monastics and female monastics, both in the Japanese case and in our Mahasangika Bhikshuni Vinaya case. There was an attempt to re-domesticate women and those seeking to expand female agency. I would like to conclude with one more narrative cycle from the Mahasangika Bhikshuni Vinaya, which I believe supports my conclusion that the, uh, that the Shukla narrative is rooted in historical realities, a historical conflict over the status of women, the autonomy of women monastics. In this story, the wealthy man Sudinna dies, and his young and beautiful wife becomes the legal charge of the dead man's brother. The brother wishes to marry the wife of Sudinna, but she confides in another woman that she is not interested in having another man. It seems that secular law is on the side of the brother, but the wife is determined to be free of him. I would note here that the story, uh, story seems to omit certain details, including the moment at which the wife of Sudinna technically becomes the wife of her brother-in-law. We don't know that information. But regardless, the confidant asks the wife of Sudinna, do you wish to be free of him? After the wife of Sudinna answers in the affirmative, the confidant says, go to Shravasti and call at the place of Bhikshuni Kali. <coughs> Ask her to ordain you and become a renunciant. The wife of Sudinna arrives at the nunnery and is soon ordained by the abbess, Bhikshuni Kali. But even after the ordination, she is pursued by her brother-in-law and legal guardian. The brother-in-law leaves his own city of Rajagruha and tracks down his wife in Shravasti. He then confronts Bhikshuni Kali, the lineage head who takes in the wife of Sudinna, saying, Without my granting permission to my wife, why did you initiate her into this order? Upon hearing, uh, Kali does not respond directly to this accusation, but simply asks to this uh, gentleman, O oh, long live one, where do you come from? Upon hearing the brother is from a rival city to the city where she is, Kali launches a powerful rhetorical strategy to intimidate the brother-in-law who is pursuing her new charge, saying, Oh, you short live one, you are a thief. The men of Rajagruha, where he comes from, come here often as spies and look for the strong and weak points in the walls of the city. She then tells one of her disciples, Bring my outer robe. I'm going to have this short lied one tied up and brought to jail. This rhetorical strategy is designed to protect her recent initiate from the imminent threat of her brother-in-law, a move which is condemned, indeed, in the Vinaya case verdict. In other words, it was the wrong thing for her to do, according to what the Vinaya says. The ruling states that a woman must be granted permission from her guardian, which is to say her legal owner, in order to join the Sangha. But although Kali's tactics are condemned, 
they reveal what I think is a fascinating dynamic that is hinted at, hinted at but not fully articulated in the Shukla cycle from earlier. I've argued that the narrative about Shukla reflects a social tension between supporters of expanded agency for nuns and a party of detractors intent on redomestication of female monastics. Shukla's status as a preacher of the Dharma and the approval she receives from the Buddha as a Dharma Bhashanaka in the case we looked at indicate that this Vinaya's authors was refusing redomestication and was embracing an expanded concept of female agency into the public space. But what makes Shukla's transformation into a preacher of the Dharma possible is her departure first and foremost from the household. It is her initiation into a lineage of saintly female figures that permits her to develop her sense of personal agency and social authority. In the narrative cycle of the wife of Sudinna, the charge of Bhikshu Nikali that I just spoke of, this process of initiation is even more clearly framed as a rejection of patrilineal authority, right? She's going to have the brother-in-law imprisoned or killed. Bhikshu Nikali is portrayed as an institutional founder and protector of the sanctified institutional space of the female monastic lineage. Just as the nuns Enkyo and Shinyo in the Japanese context justify the autonomous space of the nunnery and valorize female agency by invoking two spiritually perfected founders, these queen consorts Komyo and Hashihito I mentioned, I think that the authors of the Mahasangika Vinaya seem to be constructing in the Vinaya tradition a woman-centered lineage literarily in the same way that they were preparing the way for an institutional, if not takeover, autonomous status. Just as the Vinaya uh, legal narrative portrayed Bhikshu Nikali as an institutional protector of women's bodily agency and a spiritual guide, Bhikshu Ni Utpalavarna seems to have functioned in this manner for Shukla and others entering her lineage. So today I presented a few examples of how institutional lineage is per per portrayed literarily in the Mahasangika Bhikshuni Vinaya. But it's my contention that these are not merely literary productions, but like the nuns' genealogies of the uh, Ritsu monasteries that we looked at in Japan, they function as a written blueprint for women's institutional power and autonomy against the retrograde patriarchal threats of redomestication. Thanks very much, everybody, for your attention and looking forward to a discussion. Call on people yourself. Go ahead. Yes, Suzanne. I have lots of thoughts, and, and they're not formulated. I'm, Please. I'm, I'm wondering if you think there's something different in the kind of um, agency by Shukla, and the really not infrequent instances across texts where we see women articulating their, their wishes. So even in something that is often read as so misogynistic, the story of um, Mahapajapati having to beg again and again, we see her standing dirty, scuffing her feet, you know, having donned monastic robes, shaven head. What's special here about Shukla? Are you making it, because it seems to me you're making an argument about this particular Vinaya, and I'm trying to understand what's different between this and these other moments in texts where we see women articulating their wishes. I think as a Dharma Bonica. Okay. okay. As a Dharma Bonica, this is, uh, there are very few cases of women, there are women leaders where they have positions of authority, but actually speaking in public spaces, actually speaking in households, actually speaking presumably to householders, being invited again and again to the point where there's jealousy. Uh, I think it's pretty unique. I can't say it's absolute, of course, but it is relatively unique, uh, uh, this status as a Dharma Bhanaka, which is normally attributed to monks. That's where, that's where I would make the distinction. Okay. 
But you're absolutely right about that. There's all these other examples of agency. Yes. Please. No, no, no. no I'm, I'm going to let someone else tell that. Yes. Uh, I was just going to say, I think that um, there are more Dharma Bonicas than that, um, that we see. I, I know the poly material more, and I can't, none of the names of women that I know gave teachings, you know, are, but there are more than, than Shukla. Certainly. And, um, it, not just in the Vinaya, but also in the suttas. Um, I'm thinking of a very specific instance, I can't remember her name, where she gives a teaching on the Abhidhamma. So we have women teaching the Abhidhamma. And, and later people asked, what did, what did she teach? You know, would ask what did she teach, and she and they tell him that I would have done it exactly the same way. So there, we have quite a few, not quite a few, but we have several. A few examples, yeah. yes, absolutely. No, I I agree with you 100. percent And this the, I think for me what's significant or what's substantial, which I think is part of where Suzanne was getting at, um, in thinking about this is uh, how do we theorize this uh, female dharmabanaka? How do we think about it? In, how do we think about this figure in a way which uh, is a standard part of thinking about what a Buddhist sangha looks like institutionally, um, and not just by the way, and not just tossed in? So I think you're absolutely right. The idea here is not to say that she's the only one, but to say that this. Let's start thinking about this as a model for when we think about women's status institutionally within the sangha and that they were contributing to and remaking the Sangha, as opposed to Mahaprajapati, who, which is, of course, in, there's agency there in that story, but it's the go-to. And because it's the go-to, I think it presents a more limited view of women's agency, actually, compared to this uh, female Dharmabhanaka status, which I think is more powerful. The other aspect of it, too, is I think it helps us link to other traditions in Asia, to think about this as being we should, my, my argument actually was that, is that this female Dharmabhanaka should be a standard in the way that we think about the Buddhist monastery, and the way we think about something like, I mean, playing with these words, but vernacular vinyas. Amy has talked about this quite a lot. We talk about vernacular vinyas, not something that's come down from God, but something which is being created by women's communities. And so we're thinking, so I'm thinking, so uh, I, I totally agree with you that there are a select number of other examples. But they, to my, my mind, in the way that um, uh, these discussions play out in the scholarly literature, and especially the textbooks, we don't see that as a standard. And if we want to start thinking about vernacular vinyas, or we want to think about uh, Buddhism created from the ground up in women's communities, then we have to uh, theorize uh, and model this in a very concrete way. So that's what I was trying to do with this. Um, if, if, if actually to spotlight all those cases which might be harder to get at in, uh, in a number of different texts. Please, please. So I, I was struck by, and I don't know the first author you were mentioning in terms of this idea that it can't, the Vinaya texts can't pop, they're only for male audi in-house audiences and they can't have anything to do with social life in any way. It just sounded very flat but to me. And given the fact that we now have two or three decades of you know, really textured reading. I'm thinking of Gregory Chopin's work about, you know, yes, they're legal texts, but particularly the Munas of Astavada and Vinaya is obviously presenting problems that they were facing on the ground. You know, it just, it just seems so strange to me that somebody would have this, you know, such a robust argument against um, the kind of reading that you're doing, where, you know, this obviously was an issue for them. We don't know, you know, it, sure it's, it's an ideological kind of text and it's doing certain kinds of rhetorical and legal work, but it, the idea that it has nothing to do with how people were living on the ground seems to me to be quite odd. Um, and I, so I was sort of surprised you didn't, you didn't frame it in a larger way <laughs> around some of the kind of interesting social history people have been doing for a long time with these kinds of texts. I think that's a really good point. And, and so, Part of the problem is that post-structuralism has worked its way into Gregory Chopin's work. He doesn't call what he does history, ever. And that is really confusing for students. He doesn't say he's doing social history. In fact, he says multiple times, and he goes back and forth, right? But he goes back and forth, and you don't get this really, really clear sense that social history can be done. And he says the opposite a lot. He says, oh, well, we have a literary production here. Oh, it's literary production over there. He's deeply influenced by post-structuralist sensibilities. 
And there's, a, I mean, um, there's, there's wonderful work being done, of course, by people like Alice Collette, and the list goes on. But even in Alice Collette's work, the, the sense that, that uh, social history being done is very little theorizing about it and very concrete sense of what a history would mean, what it would look like, how are we linking the literary and the historical. So I think part of it is that the reason why I made, yeah, your, your point is really well taken, why make such a strong case, for example, using Yves Yervi's work, which is heavily based on this idea of post-structuralism, where, whereby texts are, are the hermeneutic of suspicion, is, uh, of suspicion is so strong that there can't be history. Why did I, make, why did I start with that? It's precisely because not only Chopin, but many, many other uh, uh, scholars who are doing this kind of work will often pull back from the uh, uh, historical claims in, to, to the extent where, to my, my experience, students are confused. Did this happen or not? Right? Because I think in Buddhist studies, as I said earlier, we often are very comfortable with doing philology that slouches toward history, but not confident about saying, to the best of my ability to analyze what's going on here, this is an historical event. Or maybe we don't want to use the word event. Maybe we want to say there is a model for thinking about the sociology of the everyday here. The sociology of the everyday, boy, wouldn't it be nice to see that in Buddhist study scholarship about uh, nuns' lives. Um, Amy, I feel like, has been the strongest on it, saying, no, no, we really should do history. But you, you rarely see that. So, Part of what I'm doing by presenting, starting with the most radical claim in the opposite direction is to point out the extent to which we haven't done that uh, um, in advocating for social history. So uh, maybe it seemed a little extreme. Uh, sorry if I struck a wrong note there. But, but that, was the, that was the thinking behind it. And, and what, I, what I've tried to do with this and some of the other stuff I've been working on is really try to do the best I can to try to say, we're going to try to do a social history. This is real stuff in here for precisely the reasons that you said. But really being, you know, whatever qualifications I may make, that it is still social history, not just a literary study. That was the thinking, anyway. Jamie! <laughs> uh, well, um, so I know the Japan side more, so I'm sort of curious. Yeah. I where you were going with that comparison. So yep. um, a couple of concrete questions first. Yep. Is Hokkeiji uh, uh, Rishu? Uh, Ritsu. Uh, Rishu, Ritsu. It is? Yeah. And Co according, to, according to Lori. I'm just depending on Lori okay. Meeks's. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so Rishu, Ritsu means Vinayam. And in the early six schools of Japanese Buddhism, it was one of the six schools, the, the Vinaya school. Um, so that's a Dharma Gupta lineage, right? I believe Actually, so. China, right? Um, and then it was absorbed into the Shingon school mm -hmm. as a school, right? Right. So, you're, so Hokkeiji today is a Shingon slash Vinaya in terms of its lineage connection, right? So what's the point? Because you know, I, when I think about women's monasteries in Japan, it feels to me like you could do very rich, and, and uh, what's her name at Columbia has done very rich um, stuff there, social history. I mean. Uh, like across the street from my home in Kyoto, I have an, an imperial women's uh, temple, right, a monzaki. Um, so what, what's, I'm not quite sure what your point was in that comparison, um, what you were trying to get at. I mean, Lori's work, and um, Hokkeiji is still here, we still have it, it's, I'm actually sort of blood related to it, in fact. Um, and what you're talking about in, is long gone, so I'm, I'm not quite sure, can you, uh, She's, well, so, so she's talking about obviously the medieval resurgence of of right. of. Uh, it's still there today. Right. It's the gateway to D.T. Suzuki's. Uh, right, right, right. Uh, uh, warehouse. <laughs> yeah, no, she's she's only talking about the medieval period, and what she's talking about is a conflict. There was a conflict between those who wished to uh, limit or get rid of the uh, monastic orders for women, and she's talking about those who wished to establish them firmly as in autonomous institutions for women. That's so your point is, is parallel, literarily parallel. Now, what's the point of talking about a literary parallel between Japan and India? What I'm talking, it's not about the sectarian distinctions. What it's about is women who are creating uh, a text, a textual community of women in both contexts in which there is a, a, 
a, a, a literary drawing out of a lineage and creating a connection to certain sainted women of the past in order to establish why do we get to be autonomous institutionally? Why? Look at this book. Look who we got in our lineage. Bhikshuni Kali. Right? Who do we have in our lineage? Utpalavarna. Right? Who do we have? We have Shukla. And what do these models tell us we should be doing with our institution? That's the idea. In Japan, we know that the literary production directly had a relationship to institutional power in the medieval period. Direct relationship, direct correspondence. In India, we can't do it. Can't do it. But the parallel to me is striking enough that if you have a textual community who is doing this and who is creating models of women who are public figures, who are autonomous, who are independent, etc., then that to me strikes, it strikes me that, that's a, that that is a literary record of an institutional conflict. In Japan, we know that that's what happened. I'm saying, look at the parallels literarily, and shouldn't we presume that what we see in the text, which is clearly a conflict, is borne out institutionally? That's the idea. Got it. Thanks. Yes. So I'm really excited that you are working on the Mahasanga Pavinia. I think it's absolutely fa fa fabulous that you and Amy Langenberg are doing a translation together. And I, I think that that will give us some very important information on the nature of um, women's lives as nuns. Um, it's, it's really great. I, 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 just, I just wonder why autonomy, though, Mm. The issue right. is so important for you to lift out because I yes. feel like you are you're 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 just setting yourself up to become a, a target on that particular word, which is such a loaded word, and I don't know how necessary autonomy is as a concept to illumine um, the kinds of work that nuns were actually doing, the fact that they might even have been speaking publicly. Right. So, so why are you kind of, you know, sticking your ground on the world? <laughs> right. Yeah, no. I'm asking you. Yes, great question. Um, I'm okay with the word agency. I'm not against it. And it is an important word. And the word agency signals, uh, signals a certain uh, uh, resistance uh, a willingness of a body to negotiate power, no matter how little power they have. To my mind, that's what agency does. Yeah, but, but that was precisely what Sabah Mahmoud argued against, that very narrow definition right. of agency. Right, right. So I don't, I don't know that you have to tie yourself to that. People have gone beyond that conception of, of agency at this point. Right, right. Well, I, I don't want to. I don't want to be confined by that. That that term, that way of understanding agency, definitely not. Yeah. But I think autonomy is more powerful. Why? Why? Why is it more powerful? Why choose a different word than just agency? But, but it's not to say that agency can't be used in these circumstances, right? It can be to a certain extent. Uh, within her household, she has before she becomes a uh, a nun, she has agency, of course. Right? She still has agency, right? So. We can still talk about that word. It's not a bad word to my mind. Why choose autonomy? To me, the idea of choosing autonomy is that we're talking about institutional segmentation. Right? And what do we have in, this, in, her, in her case for reading this case? Uh, the way I've read it, anyway. We could definitely argue about how to read the case. But how I've read it is you have one lineage and another lineage, two male lineages that are using women as currency to, their be to the best of their ability, right? The permission is required for a woman to leave her natal home or to leave her husband's house in order to become a nun, right? So there's a kind of conspiracy between two lineages, right? The, the, the institutional power of the family and the institutional power of the Buddha Sangha, right? So uh, I think we would agree that those two uh, lineages have autonomy. They are institutionally autonomous. Family is not the monastery, right? We're talking about other uh, 
sort of uh, semi-legal or legal king, merchant guilds, and so on. Right? They are autonomous. What's really compelling to me about uh, um, uh, Bhikshu Nikali is that we're talking, it seems to me, I could be wrong, but it seems to me that we're talking about an institutional power that she has, that she wields, that is neither the institution of the family, nor is it the patriarchal power of the, mon the monks. She's going against both and shielding her disciple that way to provide the disciple with what I would call not merely agency, but autonomy, institutional autonomy, separate from those two lineages. Now that's, how, that's the distinction I would make between agency and autonomy and why I think I would, I would prefer to use autonomy in, in that specific instance. Now again, we could use the word agency in lots of other examples, but that's the distinction I would make. But I'm curious w what you think or how you would, what, what, what do you think of that way of doing things or how would you do it differently, if you would? Yeah, I'm, I'm Yes, of, of, of course the, 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 the male sangha is in power, and of course nuns bow to the monks and so on, and in that sense you could say they are not autonomous, right? But in terms of the, the, the everyday life of the nuns, it just doesn't matter, right? And, and this is a different situation, so the situation with Bhikshri Kali is where she actually has to take some kind of, you know, legal action to protect this person. Right. Right, but, but I, I, I just, um, you know, I mean, I just wonder what other readings, for instance, there might be with um, Shukla and the jealous nun. Mm, right. Is, is this a power struggle against male patriarchy? Or is this, is, this, is this something else that's going on? I mean, right. there's jealousy there. There's something maybe very human going on there as well. Unless you want to assume that, that people are putting kind of patriarchal words into these, you know, so-called jealous nuts. Mm. I don't know if, you know, if that's how you're thinking about it. Yes, that's exactly how I was thinking about it. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't go into details about that yeah. reading, but that's, you're exactly right. That's, that's how I was reading that's how you their voice. It, right? and yes. I, and, and I come at it thinking, yeah, in communities, there, there's, 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 there's jealousy. I mean, there's power struggle. There, maybe there's power struggle amongst the women there. I don't know. I, I, I don't Absolutely. Push, push back too far, but I just, yeah, just, just the, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll stop. No, that that no, I, that's that's well. I'll, I'll, I want to address what you're saying because I think I think yeah, we're, there's a human beings. <laughs> can they be jealous? Yes, they can. And and can you you know do you have to have a patriarchal voice in your mouth in order to be jealous? No, of course not. Right. I mean these right. So your point is well taken. That's possible. That's an entirely possible reading. The way I thought about that reading, but I also thought about a lot of other circumstances in which women clearly act as the hammer that knocks down the uppity nail <laughs> in order to intentionally or unintentionally keep those patriarchal structures in place. There's so many examples of this, right? Like the bad nuns. I mean, Sulanda is a great example. That's one example. But we could go outside of India even or lots of... So, um, I don't, I, it doesn't, it doesn't ha even have to be an either or. It could be both personalities and this specific context and, 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 and human foibles and so on. But I would also, I think we can also, even if, that's, even if that is the case, I think we can still also make room and see the likelihood that them bringing this issue to the Buddha for adjudication Right, where they hope that the Buddha is going to say, you are bad, don't do this, get back in your place, intentionally or unintentionally can still lead to this kind of reaffirmation of patriarchal structure. Um, so, but anyway, we, we, this, I think it's a conversation piece. In this case, right, she has to just depend upon and him. So then are there further stories of her that continuing to go out and preach in the public, or is this just a one-time moment in the text? Uh, this, in, in, this, in the Mahasangika Vinaya, this is where 
uh, this is where it trails off. Although there's, there's slightly different versions of it, which provide interesting variations and details on this theme. The Chinese version, for example, paints her less as a bhashanaka or a dharmabhanaka of some kind, and paints her more as a kind of a lounge singer. <laughs> um, so there's an interesting, what, who, what's the voice there uh, in that text, right? She's, she's sort of like sexy and enticing in that text. So um, there are variations which, which make for a rich discussion about what kind of voice do we have operating in the text. Um, um, but it, this is the end of the story, generally speaking, in terms of the narrative in the Masangika Vinaya. Thank you very much, though, because your your point is well taken, um, and I think there's a possible way to read the two together, even. Why autonomy and not sovereignty? Oh, great question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what do you think? I mean, I don't have expertise. <laughs> I yeah. think about post-colonial feminism, <coughs> and I think about sovereignty, I think about autonomy as defining the thing in relationship still to what it is being autonomous from, Right. and sovereignty defining the thing as itself, right. right, or as a central. So, yeah, that's, that's a, I, I mean, it's, that's a great point. I mean, yeah, I, 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 I would never be so bold as to go that far in, in my reading of this, of sovereignty. But boy, I would love the idea of like being forced to read sovereignty in the text, and how would you work that out? Um, yeah, it, I think the, the reason why I guess I wouldn't have chosen is exactly because of your definition, is because I think sovereignty takes the person, uh, the body of this woman, too far out of the context of negotiation with power structures. That's how I think I would do it. I mean, and actually, it's an interesting question. Is there such thing as sovereignty for a human body? I mean, there's the ideal in certain rights traditions, but the, the, the nitty gritty day to day, can you find some? Yeah. Like, I'm sorry? The Terry Gata? Yes. Like, the Terry Gata is a, the, the verses of the nuns in which they have found this condition of freedom. Freedom, right. It, you know, I mean, you, I think you could do a reading of that in which you would find something like sovereignty in many of these voices. It's a very cool idea. Um, yeah, no, definitely. Um, I guess I, in, this, in this context, I definitely didn't go there. Um, but that's an interesting idea, the, f the freedom, sovereignty, and thinking about that as a reading. And there's no relationship like, between that's sovereign right. bodies or sovereign nations. Or... Mm -hmm. yeah. I think the other piece I'm wondering about is um, how much autonomy is connected to individuality. Hmm. In the context of the Terigata, you mean? Yeah, yeah. No, and also just in the context of, of, of you know, this, this is a community of women. It's about relationship. Mm. And so autonomy is just like a word that screams individuality. Mm, right. I'm just wondering about that. Yeah, oh, I, I love this. So, so, um, <laughs> so when she, what, so let, let's, I just to take the moment at which she, um, She's serving her husband, and then she, the husband sort of turns on her, and she's like, this relationship is over. I am done with you. And I am done with this legal confine, which I think is, it's not just an emotional thing. It's a legal move she's making. And of course, she does get his permission. At least the text has us say that. But the whole spirit of it is not about legal permission. The spirit of it is like, I'm doing this. I don't care what the law says. Um, and then, but the Vinia editors are sticking all kinds of stuff in there, I, I think. But at any rate, she does get the legal permission, but she's changing her legal status. And that to me is where I would use, maybe not sovereignty, although maybe, maybe, not, maybe I would, I don't know. But that is where I would want to use the word autonomy. Because, because it's, it's, it's an emotional change. She's also removing her body from a certain circumstance. It is, that level of segmentation, um, it's the auto, it's the self, it's maybe even the ego, 
right? It's me and screw all of you, right? You husband and by the way, his parents and everybody else, I'm out of here. And it's the auto sense of it. I am myself. I am the owner of my own namas. Autonomy. I think it is autonomy in that sense. It may also be agency, and maybe it is sovereignty to some extent too. But I, I, did, I did use the word purposively because um, I think that moment when she makes that decision, she is, uh, she may be in relationship to her husband's lineage. She may be in relationship to Bhikshuni Upalavarna. She may, and so on. She does have a relationship. Is she actually autonomous? Of course, no human being is ever. No body is, is actually autonomous. But the spirit with which she does it, not just emotionally, physically moving her body, but legally, I think is a pushing away, a segmentation, a this is what's, what I'm dealing with here. And I'm not thinking about community. Same thing with, um, and I think that's what I love about the, the other story, which I didn't actually put up, um, a wife of King Sudinna, um, of Sudinna, the wealthy man Sudinna as well. Uh, What's the language that Davinia has when um, she's about to be remarried into her brother's family, her husband's family again, reabsorbed into that lineage? She's talking to her confidant, and she's not thinking about community. She's like, no to you, no, 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 this. And then she goes to Bhikshuni Kali, and Kali, right, is like, yes, I'm going to protect your autonomy. That's why I think the word... I think it's still useful here in this context um, because I think the language, and this is, what, this is also what's so cool about these particular texts. It's, I think it's hard to find this kind of really nitty gritty language in a lot of other places. And it's not exclusive, of course, but that's the reason why I loved reading these. And when I found it, I was excited about them precisely for the reason that you're putting your finger on. It's like, can we really call it that? Um, and, but I, I do think, based on the language put in the mouths of these women, by what I think are women authors, I, I, I am comfortable with autonomy. But what, what, do, what do you think after? I, I, I would make the same choice. Okay. But yeah, that's, that I, I, I'm so glad you mentioned that because I think there is a reason. It's a continued discussion. Yeah. Yeah. We have time for one more. Bruce, I see your hand. So, Nick, thank you for so much for. Nice to see you. Oh, my God. It's great to see you. <laughs> Crash land. So, you're, you're taking me, of course, beyond my sphere, which is, of course, the 1960s Japanese dance. But <laughs> um, so I was really struck in the beginning by this sort of aside that we can infer that the monks are being asked to do housework. I mean, sorry, the nuns are being asked to do housework for the monk mm. by the fact that there's a prohibition. Mm, right. And, and it seems like your entire project is what can we infer from these texts? Totally. Right? Totally. At, at the bottom. And, and so I guess what I want you to do is do the inference for me. Like, I think we can infer that women are asking to join, right? Um, women are saying, I don't want to marry my brother-in-law. Like, maybe, you know, like my brother was, my, my husband was fine, but my brother-in-law is an asshole. I mean, isn't this the thing you're saying is like, we can infer these things. So what are the things that we can infer from the text that you're presenting for us? Can you just sort of spell out, like, what's, if, if, if I just have to say, here's, here are my six, ten, whatever inputs that I think I feel pretty damn confident about. What are they? You know, this is, you know, now we're, we're back to those undergrads, and you're feeling like the undergrads haven't got the idea that they can do social everyday history. Mm, right. So, what, you know, pretend that we're all your undergrads, <laughs> and you're going to do the inferences that you feel really comfortable making on the basis of the text you've read. I don't think I can think of anybody as my student in this room, <laughs> so I'm not going to do that, play that game. But, but, no, uh, but yeah, no, but, I, but in, in terms of, so there's a lot to say about this. Specific question uh, about the um, prohibition on X, Y, or Z, this is Jan Natier's thing, um, which I think she actually gets from biblical criticism, which is to say if something is prohibited, there's a good chance it's happening. It's happening. Right. Not in every case. And I would qualify that. And I would say, I, I wrote a paper trying to talk about um, this stuff. Um, 
uh, in which I, I, I talked about, uh, and I stole the first thing from B, uh, Biko and Aleo, objects. I always start with objects. Very easy to prove that an object in a text was probably belonging to that place. And then, so he talked, he, in Biko and Aleo's, uh, 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 one of his articles, he talked about uh, keys, the type of keys, latches used in monasteries. Material culture mentioned in text. It's not always the case, but generally speaking, it's a good place to start. Objects, everyday objects. And then I thought about deserto and how we use everyday objects, particularly if there's a nice phenomenology, a nice thick phenomenology, gearts, whatever, in how that key is used. Put it into the door, et cetera. You need a verb. Practices, social practices by which objects are used. I did this in talking about cemetery asceticism, so it becomes a little more real if you look at that context. And then locations. Now, not every location that you see in a Buddhist sutra is going to be a real one, right? You have heavens and hells, et cetera. But you, you have a lot of fairly thick description of locations. So I always start with Jan Natier's, uh, uh if something is prohibited, then um, it's a good, there's a good chance we're talking about an historical reality especially about everyday life, not always. And then qualifying that, can we locate phenomenologically objects, practices related to those objects, and then locations in which that happens? So trying to get a thicker and thicker description phenomenologically of those prohibited things, or not necessarily prohibitions. It could just be something that's heavily regulated. If you see 100 different things where you're prohibited from doing it, or prohibited from doing it a hundred different ways, there's a good chance that that phenomenon is happening. So these are the kinds of, it, uh, that, that's the kind of standard by which I would just kind of start, those four rules. Um, but I think that that's a pretty good place to start for thinking about everyday objects, practices, and locations in the Vinaya. But, but I mean, I guess I'm trying to um, get a sense about how far you're taking this. Do you feel like, uh, the story of a woman kind of playing to the head nun and then the head nun basically saying, we're going to protect this woman as best as we can. Can we generalize from that to assume that there are women fleeing to head nuns and the head nuns are trying um, within the limits of, you know, of like a patriarchy and stuff like that to really like, you know, protect the, the women who are coming to them from you know, whatever it is that's the from, being married off to their brothers-in-law or, you know, being, you know, sent back to their husbands or something. I mean, do you feel comfortable saying, yeah, this was part of the life of the, um, the nunnery is sometimes someone showing up and saying, I don't want to be in the marriage I'm in anymore. Can you accept me? And them saying, we'll try everything we can. Or I don't want to marry my brother-in-law can you help me out? And them saying, yeah. I mean, is that, is, are, you, are you comfortable going that far? I think in a shame-based society, men feel shaming, shamed by women's behaviors that defy them. We know of such societies. <laughs> we don't have to go too far for that, right? Men particularly are susceptible to that kind of thing, and especially men in power. And when the face the honor of a man is impugned, there's no, want, there's no desire to admit it, especially not in a textual record. So these stories, to me, do not smack of uh, the, the, the honor, the power, the domination, right, of men writing a vinia. This, 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 everything about this is an embarrassment to male power. Every instance of women in these stories would be regarded as an embarrassment to these societies. And because of that, why would you ever write it down? This is Shane Clark's uh, way of explaining certain of his interpretations of marriage, uh, married nuns. So um, I would go with that principle. And I would say yes to your question. Thank you so much. Nick. Thanks, Jamie, um, and thanks everybody for coming. Appreciate it. He, he came up here to learn East Asian languages, and then he goes to Japan and does Sanskrit and Indian studies. Like, what, what, what can we say? Wonderful job. Thanks very much. Thank you very much.
Um, if you're interested in this topic, um, hey, well, switch shifting over to Japan. Um, uh, this coming Monday, uh, Taiketsu Unno uh, was kind of the founder, I'm going to say, uh, of, of East Asian studies, certainly here at Smith, maybe Buddhist studies in, in the valley in general um, a long time ago. He passed away a few years ago, but um, he was the Jilker Conway Professor of East Asian Studies and Religion here, teaching Buddhism uh, for a long time. And this coming Monday, uh, we have the Tai Tetsu Unno Memorial Lecture. And the, uh, the speaker is Jessica Starling. I don't know if you were Oh, yeah. In Japan. She was there that year. Probably yeah. And um, she'll be here talking about um, uh, temple wives in contemporary Japan. So if you want to switch over to East Asia and talk more about uh, Buddhist women, uh, please come on Monday. I believe it's 5 o'clock right here. So thanks again. Thanks. Thanks, everybody.